Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, today we're studying in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And as usual, we're going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So let's jump right in. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. So now there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Because we are joined to Christ, we are not condemned. We are freed from the condemnation that will come to those who are, are not joined to Christ, those who are not in Christ. Our being one with Christ is our assurance of, of no condemnation. Those of us who are believers, those of us who are followers in Christ, have no condemnation. We not only uh, belong to Christ, but we're joined to him, and because we are joined to him, we have the Holy Spirit that gives us spiritual life, and it frees us from the power of sin that leads to death that Paul talks so much about. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to walk in the Spirit so that we no longer are bound to fulfill the lust of our flesh. We are freed through the Holy Spirit to do the will of God. Now I'm reading verses 3 and 4. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So those who sought God's approval by keeping the law of Moses failed miserably because human flesh is too weak to perfectly obey those laws. No one was able to keep the law of Moses perfectly. Uh, so God did what the law couldn't do. He sent his son Jesus, uh, the Christ, in a body like ours, but without sin. He has a sinless body. God offered Jesus his sinless body up as a sacrifice for our sins. This sacrifice of the body of Christ broke sin's control over us. Jesus fulfilled the just requirements of the law for us. He lived it perfectly. Now we are declared righteous because of his sacrifice. We are also given freedom from slavery to sin and the power to live in obedience to the will of God. Now that we are followers and believers of Christ and we're joined to him, because we're joined to Christ, his life, his energy and righteousness flows from him to us and produces the fruit of the spirit in our lives. Jesus said these words, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's John 15, 5 in the New Living Translation. So the life of Christ produces the fruit of obedience and righteousness, righteous living uh, in our lives. His life also gives us the power to resist sin and to walk in the Spirit. Now, walking in the Spirit is not some mysterious thing. Walking in the Spirit is simply obeying the Word of God. It is walking in obedience to the word of God and the will of God. We are not walking in the spirit when we are fulfilling the lusts of our flesh. Uh, we are detouring from the path of the spirit when we're engaging in sin. But when we turn from sin back to obedience to God, we are again walking in the spirit. Jesus said these words, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's John 16, 13 in the New Living Translation. Now I'm reading verses five and six. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature 
think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So God wants us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind when we become Christians. When we turn to Christ, we begin to think about Jesus and the things of God. There arises in us a a deep desire to please God. The Holy Spirit begins to bring these thoughts and desires into our heart and into our mind. Jesus said these words, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. That's John 14, 26 in the New King James Version. Jesus speaks to us through his written word, through the preached and taught word, and through prayer as we meditate upon him. The Holy Spirit will bring these words back to our remembrance when we need them. Now, we should feed and encourage and cultivate this good work of the Holy Spirit in us by reading the Word of God, by meditating upon the Word of God regularly, uh, by spending time in prayer, and by being faithful in church attendance, and and listening to to sermons uh, on the radio and, and on tape. We should feed our minds the spiritual things of God, the Word of God. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring right thoughts to our mind, to present what is right to us, and to to guide us. And and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit by feeding our minds and our hearts of the Word of God, by memorizing the Word of God, uh, and by walking in it. Now, verses 7 through 8, I'm reading. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It uh, It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Every human being is born into this world with a sin nature that is hostile to God's laws and cannot obey them. The only way to get out from under the uh, dominance of the sinful nature is to place our faith in Christ and receive his Holy Spirit. Paul wrote these words to the Galatians. He said, But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. That's Galatians 3, 22 in the New Living Translation. Without the Holy Spirit's help, we can never obey God. People who are not joined to Christ cannot resist the pull of the flesh towards sin and cannot please God. Unbelievers are under the control of their sinful nature and cannot please God. Now I'm reading verses 9 through 11. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. So when we turn to Christ in faith, God frees us from the control of the sin nature and gives his Holy Spirit to us, and we come under the Spirit's control. Every true believer has the Spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit living in him or her. Anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit does not belong to Christ and is not a true Christian. When we turn to Christ in faith, he gives us his Holy Spirit. Now, it's, it, we want to be, stay full of the Spirit. We want to be full of God's Spirit. Uh, and so we, we uh, pursue him through his word, through prayer, disciplining ourselves, Um, and yielding ourselves to the will of the Holy Spirit so that we stay full of his mind, full of his spirit, and full of the power of God. If Christ lives in us, Paul says, our body will die because of sin, but the spirit will resurrect us because we have been justified or made right with God. The very same spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to our mortal bodies and make us immortal. He will resurrect our bodies just as he raised the body of Christ. 
If we happen to die before Jesus comes, he will resurrect us, transform us into immortal beings. But not only will he raise our mortal bodies from the dead, the Holy Spirit gives us abundant life right here and right now. The life and energy of the Holy Spirit is working in us. Um, if we are believers in Christ, if we're followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit is working in us even now. Jesus said these words, I came that you might have life in abundance. That's John 10, 9 and 10. You know you have the Holy Spirit in you. Number one, if you were led to Jesus Christ and were led to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on a cross to save us from our sins. Number two, if you feel the deep desire to worship and honor Jesus. Thirdly, if you have a deep desire to obey and please God. Four, if there has been a change in your life for the better, to obey God and follow him. And if you have a desire to be more like Jesus. And then finally, if you want to love rather than to hate. All these things together uh, are evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in you. And you want to uh, rejoice in the Lord and give him thanks uh, if he's working in you that way. You are a believer. You have the Spirit of God in you. And you need to follow Christ and, and get full of the Spirit, stay full of the Spirit of God, and walk in his Spirit. Now I'm reading verses 12 through 14. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Well, if you live by it, its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Since you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are not obligated to live the old sinful lifestyle that you once lived. If you continue to live under the control of your old sinful nature, living a sinful life, you will die. The sinful lifestyle is for unbelievers, not for believers. Uh, and unbelievers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, So if, 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 if you claim to be a Christian, but there's no change in your life, and you're still living that old sinful lifestyle, then you're living the life of an unbeliever. And, and Paul warns that those who live this way will, will die, um, um, fall under the judgment and the, the wrath of God. Paul gave this stern warning to those who live under the control of their sinful nature, and I'm reading his words. I'm quoting him. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 in the New uh, International Version that I just read to you. Now, this is not to suggest that believers who fall into sin and repent and turn back to righteousness will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul is speaking of people who practice sin as a lifestyle. Uh, a sinful lifestyle is evidence of unbelief, not faith. And God has given us the power through the Holy Spirit to live a brand new kind of life, uh, a life of righteousness and peace. Now, if we kill out the sinful deeds that we used to be dominated by, we will live, Paul said. Uh, we put these deeds to death by using the power of the Holy Spirit to resist them and to turn our back on them, refusing to to do them, to engage in them anymore. Not by sheer willpower, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm reading verses 15 through 17. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our, uh, with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Now, turning to God doesn't make us fearful slaves, but children of God. We were slaves to sin. The Jewish people were slaves to the law. But when we turn away from a sin 
to serving God, we're no longer bound by sin. We are freed. We are children of God. We are adopted into God's family when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. The very first gift we receive from our Father is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we call him Abba, which means Daddy, our, our dear Daddy. We are his children. He is our Daddy. The Holy Spirit joins with our human spirit and declares publicly and openly that we are the children of God by providing clear evidence of the fact that we are God's own children by changing us more and more into God's image and likeness. So um, our following and imitating God is evidence, the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in us, that we are his children because we begin to think like him. We begin to uh, act like him. We begin to follow him. The Holy Spirit begins to produce the fruit of at, uh, or the attributes of our Father in us. In fact, we are commanded to begin to imitate our Father. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus these words. He said, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. That's Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. As God's children, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Everything the Father has, we get. Everything he gives to Jesus, he also gives to us. Uh, we will have a powerful, glorious, radiant, glorified body like Jesus has. We will rule over the new earth along with Jesus. We will be immortal, just like Jesus. We will be sinless and perfect just like Jesus, and we will, uh, we will be wise and intelligent, just like Jesus. But if we expect to share his glory in the future, we have to share his suffering now. That means persecution sometimes. That means ridicule sometimes for what you believe. That means trouble, trials, tribulations, and hardships sometimes, just for being a Christian. But if we suffer with him now, we can reign with him then. Now I'm reading verses 18 through 21. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against this will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So all of creation was subjected to death and decay because of what Adam and Eve did. The curse came upon not just Adam and Eve, but also upon all creation. And so death and decay comes to every living thing. The things that we go through now, though, are now uh, are, are nothing compared to the great glory that will be revealed in us. The hardships that we suffer as Christians, the difficulties, the disappointments, the persecution, they're nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us when God unveils us as his sons. It's like giving a penny and getting a thousand dollars in return. We will shine like the angels. We will be honored and respected. We will rule and judge even the angels. We will live in a perfect paradise in perfect bodies with perfect minds and rule over a perfect sinless world with no sickness, disease, crime, or injustice of any kind. There will be no pain, no worries, no trouble. That's just a sampling of what's uh, in store for us in exchange for what we suffer here on earth now. Um, if we are believers and followers of Christ, we have all of this waiting for us. We have so much to look forward to as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 19 tells us, that all creation is waiting for the unveiling of the children of God. The angels, the animal world, and every living thing in heaven and on earth is waiting for the great day when God will present us glorified and perfect before all of creation. It'll be like an artist unveiling his great masterpiece. It'll be like a, a great king presenting his, his newborn son. To, to, uh, to all of the citizens, to, to every living thing. It'll be a great day of celebration when God gives us our new glorified bodies and presents us to all creation 
as his children. But all of creation will also be freed and transformed from the curse that was brought upon the world when Adam sinned. Everything dies and decays now because of Adam's sin. But Jesus said, I will make everything new. That's Revelation 21 and 5 in the New Living Translation. All of creation will share in the unveiling of the sons of God by being made new along with us. There will be no more death and decay in all of God's creation. Everything will be made new. Now I'm reading verses 22 through 23. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believe is also grown, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. So Paul uses the analogy of a woman going through labor pains to illustrate what, uh, what is happening in all of creation. We believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit as a foretaste uh, of what is going to happen, the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Uh, and he's just a foretaste of, of, of all that we're going to receive. Even though we have the Holy Spirit, again, who is a foretaste of, of our glory, we groan as if in labor pains, like a woman in labor, we want this child to come out and be born. We anxiously look forward to the new glorified, immortal, perfect, sinless bodies that God has promised us. And I'm going to tell you, the more that you know about uh, heaven and, and the new earth and all that is in store for us, the more anxious you are to receive it. Uh, the more you uh, labor wanting to, to uh, cast off this old and take on the new. We anxiously look forward to an end of the old order of things, death and disease and sickness and, and decay, crime and violence and trouble, injustice and, and hunger and starvation, war. All these things are what we suffer under in this sin-cursed world. But we groan as if, as if in labor as we wait for the redemption of our bodies and for the redemption of the whole world, of all of creation. Jesus Christ will come. He will come and take over this world. He will judge and put away the wicked and transform us and all creation from death and decay uh, to the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now I'm reading verses 24 through 27. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. So the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Every true Christian, is given this hope, this, this not just wish, but hope. And our hope is an expectation. Every true Christian is given this expectation when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to wait patiently and confidently that what we expect and hope for will one day happen. And we expect it, we believe it, and we hope for it. The Holy Spirit is our helper in our weaknesses. He prays for us with groanings that words cannot express. Their words are not enough to express uh, some of the communications that we need to make with God. And sometimes we have to groan it out. This is a mystical function of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can't say it, but we can feel it deep inside, and we groan in the Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus did this in John eleven thirty eight 38, at the tomb of Lazarus. He groaned in the Spirit. Now, verse 27 tells us that when the Holy Spirit prays for us and through us in this way, the Father knows exactly what the Holy Spirit is saying um, as he communicates from deep within inside of us. Now I'm reading verses 28 through 30. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. 
For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So now Paul is now getting into the doctrine of predestination. And of course, I believe that predestination is based on God's foreknowledge of who will believe, who will accept him. And so he plans accordingly. Romans, uh, Romans uh, 8.28 is a verse that many people quote, but it doesn't apply to just anyone. Uh, it only applies to believers. The verse says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This means uh, that this verse only applies to true Christians. If we love the Lord and are called according to his purpose for us, we've placed our faith in Christ and we're being led toward fulfilling our purpose. A good example of God causing everything to work together for good, the good of those who love him and are called uh, to his purpose for them is the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Good God, you, but God used Joseph's good and bad experiences to prepare him to become second in command over all Egypt, all of the civilized world at that time, and to save millions of lives, including his brothers that sold him in the first place. Uh, you, you need to read the story for yourself in Genesis chapter 37 through uh, 50. And Joseph has given several chapters there. Uh, and, but it's a fascinating and inspiring story. This verse is meant to comfort us and help us to relax, knowing that God is in control even over the bad things that happen to us and, then, and that God will use all of those things for our good. God sees what, what we're going through. You um, just keep following Christ. If you're going through difficulties and hardships, just keep doing what you know is right. Just keep following Christ and he'll work things out together for your good and for the good of others. Verse 29 says that God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This speaks of the foreknowledge of God. God knew us before he created us. In fact, before he created Adam and Eve, he knew every person who would be born into this world, and he knows every person who will be born into the world. He also knows what decisions in life we will make. Even the decision to, uh, that, that people make about whether to surrender their lives to Christ or not. And because he knows the future, he is able to plan out the future based on his foreknowledge. Based on his foreknowledge, God chose his people to become like his son. God chose us, God called us to Christ, then God began the process of transforming us so that we, uh, we will be like his son Jesus. We are becoming more and more like him, but we will be fully like Jesus when Jesus comes again. God will complete us when Jesus comes to raise the dead saints and transform the living saints. So when God is all finished, Jesus will have many brothers and sisters who are just like him, and, and he will be the firstborn of those brothers and sisters, having been the first to rise from the dead, okay? He was the first to rise from the dead with a glorified immortal body, never to die again. Now I'm reading verses 31 through 34. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can, be, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his son, but gave him up for us, for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand and pleading for us. Since God is for us, there is no one who is powerful enough to be against us. Verse 32 says, God gave up his son to save us. If he gave up his son, we can be assured that he will give us everything else along with his son. Jesus said uh, these words. Jesus said, it gives 
the Father good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That's Luke 12 and 32 in the King James Version. Verses 33 and 34 ask the question, who dares accuse us? And who then will condemn us whom God has chosen? After shaming her accusers and driving them away, Jesus asked the woman who was caught in adultery. I hope that you uh, have read that story uh, or know about that story of the woman who was caught into adultery. But Jesus shamed her accusers and drove them away. And afterward, he asked the lady who was caught into in adultery, where are your accusers? The woman answered, sir, I have none. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And he said, go and sin no more. We believers are like the woman who was uh, forgiven and justified. We were like the woman who was caught in adultery because we were all sinners. Um, this woman was forgiven and justified. She was forgiven and there was no longer anything to accuse her of. Jesus, her champion, had, had rescued her from her accuser. She was guilty of sin, but Jesus saved her from those who would have destroyed her and he saved her from her sin. Jesus died for us and rose again and is seated at the right hand of God, interceding or pleading for us. He forgave us uh, and gave us right standing with God, so no one can accuse us or condemn us. Now I'm reading verses 35 through 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or, or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are, we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ who loved us. Paul asked the rhetorical question, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? The obvious answer is no. But then Paul makes a list of things that, that might attack our faith and and, and, uh, and our confidence and make us question God's love. We true Christians might and most likely will experience some of these things. We'll, we'll experience trouble and calamity, some per persecution and, and perhaps some hunger, perhaps destitution, danger, and even the threat of death. But we must not let these things weaken our confidence in God's love. He loves us despite the difficulties that we have in life. And remember Romans 8, 28, he's, he's using all things. All things are working together for our good that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose for us. God still loves us no matter what we go through in this life. But despite all that, all the things that we have to go through in this life, we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. God will never withdraw his love from us. Paul informed us that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. He said that in the book of Acts 14 and 22. Now I'm reading verses 38 through 39, and we'll finish this chapter. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul goes through such a great length to assure us that nothing on earth or in heaven can separate us from God's love because we are so prone to doubting God's love. So he goes over the top and names all of these things. It is sometimes hard to convince ourselves that someone who is as great and holy uh, as God is can really love someone as insignificant as we believe ourselves to be. Paul went over the top to convince us that nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. When you're tempted to doubt God's love for you, stop and take a moment and read Romans 8, 38 through 39, and then just bask in the sunshine of God's love. Amen.
Amen. Well, that brings us to the close of Romans chapter 8, and next time we'll study chapter 9. I want to take just a minute just to tell you about the mission work that we're doing in Africa. We're helping to build churches for congregations over there who have no place to worship. Some congregations are worshiping in under trees and in brush arbors and, and uh, in uh, makeshift metal buildings. We're also helping to uh, feed the hungry. We're helping to build churches. We're helping to feed the hungry. We're helping to educate children. And we're helping to train pastors and ministry leaders. We've established a, a Bible school, Nehemiah Bible School there, to train pastors to, to uh, oversee the churches that God is calling them to, to preach out and, and to establish. For the full story of what we're doing uh, over there in Africa and other places, uh, visit our website at uh, um, bliglobal.org. That's www.bliglobal.org. Get a free PDF copy of my book, Teach Me About Heaven and Eternal Life, when you make a donation of any size to this mission work. Now, if you're living around the Indianapolis area, I want to invite you to come visit us at New Direction Church, where my son, Kenneth Sullivan Jr. is the pastor, and he's doing a wonderful job. He and his wonderful wife, Roxy. Our East Campus is located at 5330 East 38th Street, and our North Campus is located at 7701 uh, East 86th Street. For service time, visit our website at ndcbetterlife.org. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com. Please tune into our next teaching session on Vision Stream Network or listen on demand from our podcast.